order with miracles during Jesus's ministry. And uh, you'll also see on the other side, it's also providing you in order of type. We'll be referring to those here real soon. If you notice in my prayer, I offered up some attributes about our Heavenly Father. Our God is a compassionate God. Our God is a God of comfort. Our God is a God of mercy. When I pray, I always like to give credit to our Heavenly Father and to sound those things off because our Father likes to be praised. He likes to be honored. And I would encourage you that when you pray, you also look for that attribute that you can use to lift him up and to show glory and to show honor. I want to share with you a video, and the reason I would like to do this, it's because it's a video of inspiration. It's a video that might just elevate you this morning just to recognize how awesome our God is. And it was a video that was inspired by a sermon that was written by, let's see, Dr. In just a moment, Dr. S. M. Lockridge. He is an African American pastor. He's deceased. He was a pastor of an African American church, uh, Calvary Baptist, in San Diego, California. And his initials S. M. How would you like to be known as Shadrach Meshach Lockridge? <laughs> With that being said, let's take a look at the video, Josh.
video clip make you want to stand up and just say it? Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. I sometimes look for inspirational. That wasn't part of the script. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Um, Josh, we'll get you just, there you go. Thank you. Uh, sometimes I look for inspirational things like that, whether it be a video, a song, a devotional, a scripture, a reading. Sometimes I go to those things occasionally to get inspired. And I'm sure all of you have something that you rely on quite frequently when you want inspiration. And that's one that I just really love. And I know that many of you have seen that before, but I wanted to share that with you this morning to establish just how awesome our God is. He's a, he's a miraculous God, a God that performs miracles. And if you look at your, um, look at your outline, Roman numeral two, would anyone here to tackle that question, miracle defined, what would be your definition? If we talk about a miraculous God, what is a miracle in your mind? A miracle. Yes, Julia. Uh, being in the medical field, I think that one of the <laughs> biggest miracles is when the doctors cannot find any treatments or any anything wrong, you know, to help somebody who's really sick. Right. There's no logical scientific explanation yeah. then, that gives an answer. <clears throat> the families and the, the congregations that this person belongs to pray and pray and pray and pray and the person becomes well. Yes. For no reason. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason for this person to be well. In my research this week, I was looking for a definition of what it means to be miraculous and what it means to have a miracle performed. These are a few that I came up with. You may agree with me or not. Yes, sir? When my son was six years old, he was scheduled for surgery. He had a tumor in his stomach. He couldn't even wear a shirt tail tuck. He had it hurt his bed. Yeah. My grandmother called me and said, don't take it, Lord. He don't need to be operated on. I said, what do you mean, grandma? There's nothing wrong. He's healed. I said, Grandma, she said, take him to the doctor. Before they operate, let him take another x-ray. You need to see the tumor. They took him in. They x-rayed him. The doctor walked in and said, throw his hands up. And you're in mind, and the doctor's mind. That there was, was nothing on the x-ray. They couldn't find the tumor. Yeah. yeah. Definition that I found this week, it's a supernatural intervention that brings on very welcome results. Would you agree to that? Amen. Absolutely. Performed by a supernatural power, probably divine intervention. Something that occurs that's amazing, that's astonishing, that's astounding, that that's incredible. That was the definition of a miracle when I was looking for that. Biblically speaking, a miracle involves God. As Christians, we have a strong belief in that. Doing something that is inspirational in order to reveal himself to mankind. Looking at, um, I want to ask you this question before we move on any further. Let's drop down to number five. Do we experience miracles today? I think we do. I think that we do. Our faith proves it that we do. I want to share with you just a case in point real quickly. A couple of you have already shared some personal miracles, present day miracles. In 1985, my mother was 62 years old. She was having difficulty walking on her right foot. Don't know if it's a broken bone or a torn uh, ligament or a tendon, but the doctor ordered her to have an exam, a physical. And while she was there, the doctor decided to go ahead and do a full-blown uh, physical from head to toe. This is the results of that physical. They had to remove two-thirds of her colon due to cancer. My mother died in, 19, uh, in 2015 at the age of 92. She lived 30 years beyond that. If you were to ask me, that was God's intervention, that was a miracle, I would say amen. 
God's hand was at work. Mom had no indication that she was having issues with her colon, nor did she have cancer. And I really feel that God intervened and prolonged her life. I believe that. Now, we've heard from a couple of you, but do any of you believe that miracles are occurring today? And do you have an example to share? Come on, folks, we're Christians. <laughs> we've all experienced miracles in our lives. Yes. Yes, miracles can be big, but I get them every Sunday morning. I'm getting dressed, ready to come to church. Amen. I look down at my clock and I go, okay, uh, I'm going to need a time warp if you don't mind. A time warp? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one minute. No, no, no. <laughs> or a time warp. Okay. And he grants it. Uh, the time literally slows down. <clears throat> and that happens all the time. Yes. Um, I, I expect miracles. I knew of a United Methodist pastor retired, <clears throat> thank God, who did not believe in miracles today. And I looked at him like he had three heads. Yeah. And I, how can you not believe in miracles? They happen every day. Yeah. If you open your eyes, you can see them. They're happening all around us. You made a point. If you open your eyes, you can see them, but we could be blind to it based on our faith. That's absolutely right. Yes. Hey, Joe. Can, yes. In 20, December 27, 2013, and I went down over the side of Christian Burton Mountain in that 18 wheeler. Yeah. And as I was in and out of consciousness, I heard somebody and I felt somebody put their arms around me and say, I got you. I got you. I immediately let go, just, just while I let go. Yeah. The thing, the truck stopped, it fell over on its driver's side. Make a long story short, I told her the tractor, the trailer, and a whole load of freight, and all I got was a scratch on my right arm. That, that was on Friday night. Sunday morning, I was upstairs singing. Yeah. And Kathleen Frank come up after the service and she had tears. I said, My goodness, Kathleen, did that thing that bad? <laughs> she said, On our Friday night, you could have been killed in that truck. Yeah. And here you are Sunday morning mm -hmm. singing and praising the Lord. I said, What else was I supposed to be doing? Somebody else had their hand up. Wonderful miracle. Somebody else. Yes. Uh, I can't really stop praising God for my miracle because I had a massive stroke in the room. And my neurologist said that I would never wake up. So for seven or eight days, I laid up there in the hospital in a coma. On the eighth day, I woke up and said I was hungry and wanted to go home. <laughs> she could work with that. Yeah. And uh, she used an experimental drug treatment back in 2008. And she stuck a needle in my head and filled it full of some kind of a rosin to, to stop the bleeding in the uh, blood vessel that I had burst in my head. And I'm sure people get tired of hearing this, but that's God's miracle for me. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing that. What a, what a personal testimony that is. Steve, did you have your hand oh, up? <laughs> what a miracle that is. What do you want? Kim, yeah. Kim, all we can say is bless your people heart. <laughs> I'm sure that we all could go around the room and share a personal testimony about a miracle and how God has worked miraculous things in our life. I want to share them more. One is, um, well, I have a lot of personal stories, but one is about my uncle. You've heard of my uncle, Barnard Saunders. There was a POW in World War II. He was captured by the Japanese when the American forces um, broke down in the Philippines and they were overtaken by the enemy. 
but he was corralled in these what they call hell ships. There were cargo ships, five of them, full of POWs that were being shipped to from the Philippines to Japan to work in their mines. En route to Japan, these five hell ships were detected by American submarines. And the American submarines opened fire, not knowing that their cargo they were carrying were Americans. There were five ships, four were destroyed, one made it through, and my uncle was on that fifth one. That's not a coincidence, folks. That's God's miraculous work at hand. And I'm sure that we all could share some very emotionally personal testimonies about miracles. And yes. I just wanted to say, um, you know, being being in your 20s and stuff, you tend to... Um, You're not in your 20s things. now, right? Oh, I wish. <laughs> anyway, but Jacob. Yes. Um, I think everybody knows who he is. He's struggling right now. And he's trying to figure out where his faith should be and um, if he even is going to come back to to um, this would have been a good Sunday school lesson for him. Yes. But testimony and miracles, uh, you know, work hand in hand. They're hand in hand. You won't have a testimony if you didn't have a miracle, in my opinion, yeah. because, you know, God, that's how God works. God works by giving us miracles. And, you know, sometimes we're stubborn and we don't see it. But right. that's how we get to where we are mm -hmm. in our faith walk. If you want to get better in your faith walk, then you will listen to these miracles and you will see them as they are. Absolutely. And then you will be able to testify to others that that's God's work. Absolutely. I felt led today to give you a copy of Jesus's miracles during yes. his ministry. I want us to take a look, just take a brief scan. On one side, you'll find the chronological order of the miracles that he performed during his ministry. And on the other side, you will find them grouped together based on the types of miracles that he performed. Just a general question. What conclusions can you draw from looking at that? Way? Let's look at the chronological order first. Tim, what conclusions can you draw? Well, just quickly analyzing, analyzing that list. What comes to mind? There's a lot of them. A lot of them. Uh, I would okay, think there would have been more than 37, though, although he was in ministry for, what, three, four years? I would have thought there would have been more, first of all, but we're going to read a verse here in just a moment that reflects upon that. So, therefore, there were a lot of them. What other things can you draw from this list? Where were they recorded? In the, news, in the yeah. Gospels. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did every gospel record every one of Jesus's miracles? No. 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 I'm scratching my head, Kathleen. Why not? Because they're, they're, every gospel has a different point of view. I mean, they Matthew has a different audience. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. And and some of them, two of the authors didn't see any of them, and some yeah, collected okay. history. I guess what you're saying is that some. There were actual eyewitness accounts where these men wrote these recordings, whereas there were some yeah. that probably heard through others. Is that kind of what well? They had first person yeah. interviews. I mean, yeah, absolutely. The only way you can get Mary's information is directly from Mary. Yeah. Which gospel recorded the least number of miracles? John. 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 Absolutely. And, and I guess when you look at all the others, it looks like the majority of them were at least recorded by three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this might be worth a personal study sometime, just to go and reference the scripture and to read and to reflect on what took place. We heard one today that was shared by Pastor Larry, and that was the miracle of Lazarus. Let's look at the order of type. What conclusions can you draw from this side? Of the handout. And when you, don't, when you glance at that, what's anything pop out for you? It was mainly healing, the majority. Right. The majority of Jesus' miracles came through healings. If you look at the little pie chart down at the bottom, lower left hand corner. How many people did Jesus raise from the dead? Three. According to this list, he raised three. He raised the uh, the widow's son. Is that Jairus? Jairus' daughter. 
And then he also raised Lazarus. Lazarus is the one reported in John. What's that? It's funny that most of the miracles aren't in John, but Jesus raising Lazarus is in John. Absolutely. And only in John. For sure. For sure. So I thought this would be just a point of information. We won't spend any more time on that, but this might be something you can slip in your Bible, you look at when you have some time you're reading and studying and reflecting on the miraculous attributes of our Heavenly Father. This might be something that can maybe lead your study. Uh, yes. What I noticed also was they were very personal. A lot of them were very personal. That individual with a loved one or whatever it was. Proud of people typically. Yes. I mean, and a lot of them didn't do, wasn't like he did them for himself. Right. Yeah. yeah. He did it out of love and compassion. Yeah. I'll ask you one more question before we move on. Um, this was creating a lot of civil unrest, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Larry, the shovel on the Sabbath. Yes. Most of them on a day when he was not supposed to be. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he did that all. Oh, he should be good. Yeah. <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to arouse the crowd. He was big in that night. Too. That was his rebel side. Yes, it was. <laughs> All right. So going back to uh, going back to Roman numeral five, do we experience miracles today? Divine intervention or coincidence? I would like to think that every person in this room who proclaims to be a Christian it is divine intervention. There's no coincidence about a miracle. And I'm sure all of you could say that. Now, uh, let's see. Kim, you said there's a lot, but really I kind of thought there would be more recorded than this. Let's go to, um, and I'll read it for you for saving time. This is coming from John 21, verse 25. And I suppose that if all the other events in Jesus' life were written, the whole world would hardly contain the books. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? There's See? so many. Yeah. There's so many you couldn't write them all. They just hit the highlights. They just few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was a miraculous God performing great works every day. There were so many that all the books in the world could not report it, which gives us another reason to proclaim our God as being the wonderful God. Another thing we don't have is we sent them out. Yes. Um, More than once with the power to do all of this. So somewhere there's a list. God's got a list of all the miracles that the apostles and the disciples. Yeah, very general. I think it's a book of Matthew. Uh, he, he does exactly what Kathleen mentions. He didn't contain that power just for himself. He actually empowered his disciples, his 12 disciples, to go out and to heal the lame and to uh, heal the sick and to cure lepers. But there were other people. And, and, and today, I really think God empowers people today to perform miracles. Like, for example, when Eric talked about his stroke experience, God empowered his doctors, his medical technicians to perform that miracle. And that's, that's something that happens all the time. Well, it's like when they were... Word was spreading around that Jesus was baptizing more than John, but it wasn't Jesus who was baptizing his disciples. He was there with them, but the disciples were baptizing. Absolutely, for sure. He, Jesus stood back and let them So when we talk about miracles, it inspires me about our Heavenly Father and the power of what he has to do, the capability he has to do. I noticed if you look at Roman numeral number six, the story of Lazarus. Is in John 11, 1 through 45. I just encourage you to read that on your own. We're, we're running short on time this morning. I tend to plan more than I can cover. So therefore, I wanted to make sure I had enough. That was my old teaching technique that I used years ago. Right, Kim? Okay, let's, right, Never Ross? Never have structure time. Yeah, I, had two, I had those two characters in my agricultural classes. Years ago. <laughs> they, were quite the they were good characters. <laughs> I wanted to look at Roman numeral six. I asked the question, are there any additional recordings in the gospel of where Jesus raised others from the dead? And the answer to that is what, David? Yes, yes, yes. 
Yep. <laughs> that was another technique that I used when I was teaching. I was discussing something. I saw oh, somebody's attention distracted. I feel like too. Be weird. Keep your eyes on me. You may be called. <laughs> the answer is yes. There were two other occasions where he raised two other individuals. We won't take time to read that. I was hoping that we could because I think that sort of sets the pattern of what Jesus did. And you'll see a lot of similarities between all three resurrections. So I do encourage you to read that on your own. And I did include the scripture where it's located, the gospel and, uh, and the book, and you can also find it here. It's worth studying, folks. Let's look down at Roman numeral number seven. These are some discussion points I thought we could talk about to maybe dig a little bit deeper in Pastor Larry's narrative from his sermon today. These are the events that led up to the miracle of Lazarus, and these are some actual lessons. I really like what Pastor Larry conveyed to us today of what we can learn from the miracle of Jesus. Lazarus, meaning... What does it mean? What God. does the name Lazarus mean? God is helping. And some of you have already given some examples of God has helped you. Just for purpose of information, I've included some scripture that you can reference because it's making reference to God as our helper. Uh, Psalm 54.4, God is my helper. Isaiah 59, behold the Lord, God helps me. Hebrews 13.16, the Lord is my helper. Those were three of 35 scriptures that I found when I was doing my research this week. Let's talk about the setting for a moment. Let's talk about the setting of the uh, miracle of Lazarus. Pastor Larry shared the name of a community of where that miracle took place. But before that, something else was going on back in Jerusalem at the temple, especially in the Solomon's Porch or Solomon's Hall, Jesus had been surrounded by the religious leaders. Why do you think they were doing that? Pastor Larry made reference to that this morning. They're trying to get him to say something that would incriminate himself. Absolutely. They were looking for reasons to arrest him, condemn him, crucify him. And what were they claiming that Jesus was, was proclaiming? Pastor and he was going. Go he was claiming that he was the son of God. I'm the son of God. No, not. How dare you to promote blasphemy? Mm -hmm. You deserve to die. We're going to pick up a stone. We're going to kill you. Did it happen? No. 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 Jesus left. <laughs> he just walked away. And then, do we know where he went when he left Jerusalem? Do we know where he traveled to after that incident where he was threatened by stoning? Not by stoning, by stoning. <laughs> <laughs> he went to the Jordan River. He went to the Jordan River. River. He went to the Jordan River where John the Baptist was first baptizing individuals. From there, he received news. I'm trying to paraphrase because we're running out of time. He went to the Jordan River where he camped out with his disciples. And it was that location that he heard word from these good friends that he had met in Bethany. Who are these two women do you think he's sitting with? Mary and Martha. Mary and, Mary and Martha, now once missing, Lazarus. But Jesus would frequently go to Bethany for rest and refuge during his ministry. He was exhausted from his walks and long talks and working with individuals. He had to go take time for rest and refuge. Do you find time for rest and refuge? And where do you go to find that time? Mine's my lazy boy in my living room. <laughs> with a blanket covered over me, I'm sleeping when Barbara comes home. I try to get up quick. I try to listen to you. <laughs> Gotta you set know, your alarm. You can believe that I've been working all day. <laughs> but Jesus goes, well, uh, Jesus goes to the Jordan River, Jordan. Yeah. He's called upon by whom? Martha or Mary, that their brother is ill. 
Martha. Martha. Martha is the first contact. Lazarus dies of an infection. Does anyone know what made that infection might be? Consumes the whole body. What I read, and I didn't fact check this several other sources, but it said, help me, Barbara, sepsis. Sepsis. Yeah. 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 His whole body was inflamed with that inflammation which caused him to die. But Jesus didn't immediately come. This is what I find is interesting. Why didn't Jesus immediately come when he was called by Martha, one of his dear, dear friends that he would often visit in Bethany? And by the way, Bethany is located on the southeast side of Jerusalem, below the Mount of Olives, about two miles. It was about a 40 minute walk based on my research. You can imagine walking two miles to Jerusalem in 40 minutes. I think that's a pretty good clip. Yeah. But that's kind of what I found out. I used to be so lazy now. Yes. <laughs> Why didn't Jesus immediately go to his friend's rescue? Because he wanted him to die. For me? He wanted him to die. Right. Jesus had a plan. Jesus wanted him to experience death. Well, he wanted him to die. Yes. So that he could raise him and God would glorify him. Right. God will receive all the glory. All right. now, now, Kathleen, help me think this through. Let's go back to Jerusalem and Solomon's Hall when you're surrounded by the religious leaders. When Jesus eventually comes to Bethany and meets with Martha and Mary, there are some religious leaders there. Yeah. Could they have been some of the same ones there who wanted to stone him that was with Martha and Mary to console him? Oh, I'm going to say yes. Yeah, because he's probably bothering him to, he, yeah. you know, to get him to say something, to be a witness to who he did this or he did that. Yeah, or he said this or he said that. Well, let's go back to the question again. Why didn't Jesus heal Lazarus from the riverbanks of the Jordan when he received word from Mary? Kathleen says Jesus wanted him to die. He had a plan in mind. He, he, yeah, he didn't just want him to be dead. Yeah. He wanted him dead by four days. Absolutely. He wanted him to die. Yes, he wanted his body to start decomposing. Absolutely. It's the desert. It's hot. I agree. Right, of what? Excuse me. That he used that time to pray and see what and think about it. Plan of action to see if it's good or bad, not if it was just question. He's already on the, you know, could very well be. I think, no. I, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. He, he emptied himself of his own will. He, he, he just opened himself up to, okay, dad, what's next? It's God's plan he's carrying out. It's not his plan he's carrying out. Yeah. He's carrying out. Well, we say, well, he emptied himself of his divinity. Well, not really, because yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> he emptied himself of his own will. Mm -hmm. The thing we have, yes. we're supposed to empty ourselves of. And he's just okay, dead with the next last week is ill. What's oh, okay, I see you want him dead four days, so everybody knows he's really Very good dead. and dead. Okay, I got it. Jeff, yes, like Pastor Larry said this morning, too, within that four day period, people had come to mourn. There were Pharisees there, Lazarus was an important person. Thank you. So it was done for God's glory so that. There's no question here. Everybody yeah. knew he was dead, and now Jesus brought him back. Right. So it's all for God's glory. And even for his 12 disciples, he still battled with them to get them to believe that he could perform these miracles. And he used that as evidence to show his sovereign power. I read this, I read this this week. The purpose of Jesus arriving four days after Lazarus' death. I didn't know this. And I could, in fact, check it up. Ancients believe that the soul remained with the body for three days after the death. It hovered over the body. It didn't leave. Pagans believe that the gods could not revive someone who had been dead for more than three days. So by, 
delaying that miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus demonstrated his sovereign power. He could have healed Lazarus when he was ill, this subject, from the river of Jordan, but he chose not to. And I think we've established that Jesus had a plan. And I'm telling you what, folks, it's really interesting when you read this. Now, remember, Jesus was working toward his resurrection, I mean, for his crucifixion. And all these puzzle pieces were falling into place. The people who believe, I just thought that was interesting. And part of this, at least from my thought, is that it was to uh, quell the doubters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm going to have to skip ahead. We don't want to take away from Pastor Larry's time, but looking at a few more of the items uh, on our outline today, the people involved in regards to uh, the raising of Lazarus, we said it was Martha, Mary, Lazarus, the disciples, probably some bystanders, certainly the religious leaders. There were a lot of people that Barbara did a nice job summarizing why he raised him from the dead at the time that he did. But there's something else that I wanted to make a point to drive home today, and that's the emotions of Jesus Christ. If you look at uh, Roman numeral uh, 7, letter E, emotions of Jesus, joy, exhaustion, anger, disgust, sorrow, compassion, frustration, agony, empathy, forgiveness. Do you think any of these emotions applied to the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead? Absolutely. I had a brief video I wanted to show you today, but we're not going to have time. But it talks about Jesus getting angry. He gets angry for the right things, for proper justice and righteousness. And the reason I wanted to show you that video was that do we sometimes get angry for the right reasons? Do we stamp our feet and say, no more, I'm going to stand up for righteousness and justice? And Jesus was doing that. Jesus didn't want Lazarus to die because he knows the, the disadvantages of death. But we all know that, uh, that Christ was going to raise him from the dead. All right. Um, look over on the back. Final outcome. Um, victory over death. I think if you were to walk away with anything today. And by the way, these are some pictures of Lazarus' tomb. As you enter from the upper level that you can see here. There are 27 uneven steps that go down to a prayer line. And then through this little compartment that you really had to get down like this to get into, but this was the actual tomb where Lazarus was buried. And part of that video reflected that. But the ultimate outcome, what I want you to rock, what I want you to take away today is this: is that if you look at uh, those scriptures that I gave you. God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. We don't have to worry about death. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And you can read the others on your own. What purposes did the miracle serve? It accomplishes God's purposes. It brings glory to his kingdom. It enables our faith to grow. It measures our faith. It acknowledges God's sovereignty. When God answers prayers, miracles occur. I truly believe that. And trust God by faith and not by sight. And I'm big on quotes. I really like quotes. And I've added a few there for you that uh, if you're looking for something inspirational to put on your refrigerator, you might put that out and put that down. But I like number six, mostly magical with a chance of miracles today. <laughs> Folks, I went through that rapidly. I planned more than I had uh, had time to share today. I have lots more to give you, but thank you for your grace today and allowing me to stand here in Doug's space, not his place, but in his space. And I look forward to you coming next week being with us. Uh, Stacy has graciously agreed to close us in prayer. So, Stacy, I'm going to let you, you finish this up. Do you not make eye contact? <laughs> I did. He asked me before. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for everybody gathered here. And may you work through each and every one of us this week and let us be your light shining out in the world. Open our eyes so that we can see the miracles. Don't let us wait for the big miracles. There's little miracles every day. Let us appreciate those, see those, celebrate those. 
be with those that aren't here. We ask a special blessing on Doug and his family that they'll be better and be back with us next week. We have lots of people that are on our hearts, Lord, that we may not have lifted up in prayer. We, you know who they are, Lord. We ask that you be with them. Bless each one of us here, gathered here today. Give us travel mercies, a great week at work. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestow on us day after day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I pray that you experience a miracle this week. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Good job, Joe. Good job, Joe. I did. I did. I did. <laughs>